Welcome everybody, it's another Wednesday night right here at quickfixgolf.com where you know every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time we get together with all our buddies and we talk golf and we have some of the greatest guests in the golf industry and tonight we've got the big one. This is the big, big Cahoon tonight. So we have Hal Sutton. Hal Sutton, it's a pleasure to have you on board. We're going to explain a little more about some of your background in about two seconds. Brought to you tonight by... I'm Darren DeMaley. I uh, used to work for Jack Nicholas for seven years, among many, many of the things that I've done. Don't hold it against them. I'm Bobby Lopez, played a little golf across the pond over in Europe, and we hang out at Tupelo we're Bay. The, and we we're are the PGA the pros there. Tupelo, <laughs> we're never going to write one of two different towns. No. Tell them what you no. want them to do, Darren. Tell them what you yeah, want so them to do. So what we need you to do is get your cell phones out, uh, take a video of your golf swing, and we're going to send you a free analysis. We're going to send you some drills and there's not a penny out of your pocket so you owe it to yourself and we want you to play better golf now so get those cell phones out and send us some videos and here's a surprise i just got this from ken downer one of our students that's online he won a tournament this week ken ken Very nice was good for ken i mean i'm telling you man he went oh, out to some, not... some event and it was a three-day event or something i can't and he's get got a georgia hat on so don't hold that against him well, he might be a Georgia fan. What can we do? Yep. But good but, for Ken. But tonight we have Hal Sutton. And Hal, please excuse me if I forgot a couple of these because I just grabbed what I could. 14 victories on the PGA Tour, 1983 PGA Championship, 1983 and 2000 Players Championship. We've got the 1983 Player of the Year leading money winner. That was a big year, 83. You got to buy some wine from 83. 1998 Tour Championship. Played on four U.S. Ryder Cup teams. That's impressive. And he was the writer, captain, the team, and uh, captain of the team in 2004. And he likes Louisiana mud bugs, and there they are. What are what's a mud bug? <laughs> <laughs> Gross. Darren's a Yankee. He's trying to figure out what Gross. But they have mud bugs out. Those things are terrific, aren't they, Al? Gross. Crawfish. Crawfish. <laughs> <laughs> mud bugs. And I, I do like, like corn. Yep. <laughs> I like them too. Okay, Darren, why don't you go ahead and ask the question? Yeah. So. Hal, can you tell us, um, you know, how much of the game, in your opinion, should be art and how much should be data? We get confused nowadays with with all the science out there, and we kind of lose lose fact of that there's got to be some artistry in the game. What, what's your opinion on that? Well, uh, that's a great question, and I'm not sure there's an exact answer. And the truth of the matter is, is the answer might be different for me than it would for you. I think every person out there needs their own formula uh, to find the best version of them. And, you know, I got into building the academy that we built because I wanted to put some definition to what I did for a lot of years. Uh, we dug it out of the dirt, literally. You know, we had grainy film, grainy cameras. You couldn't see where the club face was. You could see a little bit of the path, but... You know, we certainly didn't have any radars and uh, all the things that are available to the young people today. And I, I, you know, to me, this is what I think. I think science has kind of defined feel. You know, we keep saying that feel's not real. Well, I've got to tell you something. Uh, the radars and the cameras and everything else, there is some definition to feel now. And, uh, but the truth of the matter is the lost art is how to play the game. And these, the science will not teach you how to play the game. And, and what do you mean by like playing a game? To me, the definition of that would be hitting an eight iron, maybe 110 yards when you can hit it 160 or 170. Well, I'll give you, you're, you're close. Uh, I was teaching this kid here in Houston who's a really good player. I'm not going to mention any names, but he plays for the University of Texas. Excellent player. And I went up and watched him play a couple of years ago, and he's hitting his eight iron 175 or 80 yards. And I said to him, I want to see you hit that 140 yards. So he walks over to get his pitching wedge out of his bag. I said, that's not what I said. I want to see you hit that club 140 yards. Well, I wouldn't do that. And I said, well, that's then you're a limited player. I mean, most of the great players that I knew knew how to hit clubs different yardages, a single club different yardages. And a lot of people out there don't think about this, but 
you actually, they say you can't carry but 14 clubs in your bag. But take away your putter. Every one of those clubs, you can hit different yardages. So you might have as many as uh, 42 clubs in your bag if you really know how to play all the shots. And that's kind of what I mean about learning how to play golf, learning how to flight your ball, learning how to put more spin on it when you need more spin on it, which is harder to do in today's world. But, you know, you only learn those kind of things on the golf course. You can't learn those inside in a simulator. Uh, you've got to learn those things on the golf course. So, so why, where do you think that got lost between, like, when I was playing a kid, I, I played the same way, you know, hit lots of different shots. We played nine holes with just one club. Where do you think we, we went wrong to where, you know, the average, you know, uh, elite player is thinking just full bore on every shot? Well, when I learned how to play, I was playing 45 holes a day, spending – 20 minutes on the driving range trying to get loose. And then from there, I played golf continually all day long. In today's world, they spend most of their time on the range and they play when they have to play, so to speak. And, uh, you know, I just think that's, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot more people playing golf. Their golf courses are busy. You know, I grew up on a little nine hole golf course at there wasn't a lot of play and I could go out there and hit three balls on every hole if that's what I wanted to do. And I did that a lot. And uh, that's kind of a lost art now. Well, you know, Darren, that's and, and how that's where Bill Melhorn used to make me do these uh, exercises. He'd make me hit a wedge a hundred yards and then an eight iron a hundred yards and then a six iron a hundred yards and then a four iron a hundred yards and then a two iron a hundred yards. And you had to take the three wood 100 yards, and you had to hit your driver 100 yards. By the time you got to the driver, you had to slow your swing down, I mean, a, a ton. And he wanted you to be able to change your rhythm in a given moment. That's, that's how he did it. So uh, to that point, you know, when I first started teaching, I would tell kids, uh, they'd come in and they want to nuke everything. They want to see how far they can hit it, you know. None of them ever take enough club. They're taking just enough club that if they nuke it, it gets there, which means 98% of the time they're short which right. takes out the possibility of holding the shot most of the time. And let me tell you, that's a terrible mistake because I hold a lot of shots in my lifetime that because I had enough club in my hand. So uh, what I when I first started teaching, I'd tell these kids, okay, I want you to take a full swing with your driver, and I want you to hit it as short as you can hit it. And the kid would turn around to me and say, what do you want me to do this for us? Because I want you to feel everything that's happening. If you go full speed, you cannot feel everything that's happening. And it can't register with your mind. And so so few people know this. I mean, it doesn't surprise me that Wild Bill Malhorn told you to do that because he was a seasoned player. He knew what he was doing. He learned it the hard way. Most of the people don't learn these things the hard way. And so they don't even know how to tell you how to do that. And we've got people teaching golf that have, you know, never really played the game at a high level. They don't really, they know the science of it, but they don't know the artistry of it. I know that you said Wild Bill Belhart, so you know who he is. <laughs> I do know who he is. I do. When I met him, I was 20 years old, and I was, got my first job as an assistant pro. And I walked up to the tee, and here was this big guy with this squared off kind of chin and everything. I said, Who's that? And they said, Wild Bill Melhorn. I said, I'm scared already. <laughs> <laughs> but he, was, he was a great guy, he had a great heart and everything, but he was, he was intimidating, you know. And, and he taught me so much stuff, like that drill and many others. And he taught you how to hold it, how to, how to caress the golf club in your hand, how to feel the club face as you're hitting the ball. I mean, it was a different nomenclature than today. Well, the, the club face is in you. If you're a right-handed player, the club face is in your right hand. And as a good player, you know that. And, you know, I tell every kid that comes in, we all feel a sudden burst of speed in our golf swing. And the sudden burst of speed is not the mistake. It's the correction. So don't worry about, I mean, you, you need to correct it. That's why you're doing it. We need to figure out what made you want to correct it. And, you know, that took a lot of years of me playing golf and, feeling things and learning how to convey that to someone else. All right, Darren, let's try question number two. 
Okay, how much value should be placed on distance? Um, are you asking me that, or are you asking the world that right now? No, I mean, I'm asking you. I, I, I want to know your opinion on it. Uh, the truth is, uh, manufacturers have sold uh, distance to us and hooked us on distance. And, you know, I... I try to tell every kid I'm not interested in the one drive that you can hit off the charts. I'm interested in the total combination of 14 drivers. What can you do 14 times? Yes. And, you know, to me, I mean, I, I don't want less distance than I'm capable of. I mean, I tell every kid that comes in, I want you to get all the distance that God gave you that you can get. But at the same time, you don't need my share and the other guy's share and the other guy's share. And, um, uh, you know, I had a great player come in this last week night and, uh, he won the U S senior amateur when he was 65 years old and he's 80 now. And he called me and he said, how he said, I still hit my irons just as far as I did, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, but I can't hit my driver far. And I said, well, I hate to disillusion you, but you can't hit your irons as far as you used to either. Your seven iron now is your old five iron. Yep. Now think about that. This is a really good player. I mean, really a good player. And he didn't even add it up that, wow, they tricked me. Yep. And yep. I mean, <laughs> in some ways they've done us a, a disservice, you know, I mean, Look at what's happened to major championship golf courses like Wingfoot. What just happened? If you would have told me that Matthew Wolf could lead the U.S. Open at Wingfoot after 54 holes and only hit 12 fairways, that's not the Wingfoot that I know of. And then if you'd have told me DeChambeau was going to win it by six shots and only hit 23 fairways, I'd say that's not possible. But yet it is. Yep. Because they moved the tees back. They hit it further than we used to be able to hit it. They hit it in the rough and could still get it on the green. The U.S. Opens that I played in, when you hit it in the rough, you couldn't get it on the green. And, you know, I don't know the game we're playing now in terms of uh, – I mean, I, I do know the game, but it's a different game than I played. <laughs> All right, let's try question number three. How much does gratitude and wisdom play in the game? I know this is a this is a, a right right down to the heart for you there, Hal. So let, let, let's hear it. Uh, I was going to tweet something out this morning. I didn't do it. I'm going to do it. Uh, I'll, I'll a little prelude to this. Uh, when I first got on the tour, Raymond Floyd took me under his wing. One of the great competitors that ever played the game is Raymond Floyd. And he told me, he said, Hal, you're really going to be a force out here, but I need to teach you how to play, really play. And so we started playing every Tuesday. And he taught me the, the importance of being pin high all the time. He said, Hal, you're not going to hit it straight. You're not going to have control of the face every day that you come out here. But the one thing you can do is hit it solid every time you hit it. And When you do, and you know how far you hit it, you can hit it pin high all the time. And then when you do hit it straight and you have control of the face, you can hit it a couple of feet several times during the course of the day. So, I mean, he helped me learn that, and that was wisdom that he had gained through playing the tour for a long time. And I was grateful to him for doing that. And I have always felt like I owed other people in the game for me to take the knowledge that I gained and, and give it to someone else. The truth of the matter is, you know, I worked with so many different teachers along the way. And I, I'm not going to call any names, but many, many thought that other people stole things from them. And the truth of the matter is, none of us invented this. We got our information, wisdom, knowledge from somebody else. And then we pass it along to someone else. And, you know, I'm just grateful that 
I was somewhere in the mix. You're a thousand percent right. I always tell students all the time, they say, what did you think of that? I said, I didn't think of anything. I said, hey, I learned it from Bellhorn. I learned it from Toski. I learned it from, you know, from other players when I played in Europe, you know, Manolo Pinheiro and guys like that. That's talking in the room at night. You, you, you know, you're right. You don't, you don't invent anything. They, they'll no make a name does. for it. They'll call it the stack and whatever. They'll call it the one plane, nine plane, whatever. But they just give it a name. And that's sort of show business. It's not really, it's not really how it goes. I had the pleasure of working with Byron Nelson for two and a half years. And, uh, you know, he taught me so much as well. And, you know, he was maybe one of the greatest players, maybe could be in some ways the greatest player that ever played the game. And I'll tell you what he was the greatest at. He was the greatest gentleman that I knew in the game. And he was definitely grateful for everything that ever happened. Quick story about Byron Nelson. My rookie year, I'd been working with Byron all through the years and or through the first those two years and i finished the year i finished 11th on the money list was rookie of the year and won the last turn of the year which was disney and he called me and he said how he said why don't you come over he was at preston trails why don't you come over to preston trails i want to watch you hit some balls i said sure i'll be there in two days so i went over there and he watched me the way we do it he watched me hit ball for 30 minutes and we would spend three hours over lunch talking about golf I'll never forget this as long as I live. We, he watched me hit balls for 30 minutes. He said, let's go have some lunch. He said, you're hitting it great. So we go inside. We're having some lunch. And I look up, and there's big tears running down his cheek. And I said, are you okay, Mr. Nelson? He said, man, I'm just happy as I can be, Hal. I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, I'm just thinking about this. He said, you won more money in your rookie year than I won in my entire lifetime. And he said, you know what? He said, I had something to do with both the tour and something to do with your game. And I'm so happy that I was able to be involved. Wow. How about that? Yep. Wow. That's that's a huge story. That's it. And, and it really goes to one of the slides we're going to have that really impressed me. I'm not going to tell you which one it is yet. But um, we've sort of answered this question. Now, there was the Players' Championship. But I'm going to skip and I'm going to go back. This because this is what I personally believe that what I do with my game is far less important than what I might help somebody else do with their own game. That's your statement. Yep. Do you what? Go make it me was. cry, man. <laughs> I mean, well, that's, that's what Darren and I do every day. I mean, that's 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 our mission every day is to try and make everybody else's life a little better through golf. Um, and and you know that's that's what we can do. It's, it's all we do. Well, there's so much joy in the game of golf, and especially when you hit a good shot. And it doesn't matter, you know, your good shot and my good shot is two different shots. And yours may be better than mine. But to me, when I hit a good shot, I know I just hit it. And it's not the value of how close it got to the hole. It's the feeling that it gave me. I yes. felt it when I hit it. And as a good player, you know what I'm talking about. And it created a different sound. It just felt different as it run from the head of the club up the shaft into my hands and into my heart, as Hogan said. And, you know, that's what I hope to help other people do is to have that feeling because nothing feels better than that. You're 100% right. I really uh, take my solution. Big time. Okay, so well, here's our question on the, the Players' Championship 17 and 18. Darren, go ahead. You, you're better yeah, than um, I can, can you just kind of relive a little bit that 18th hole tee shot and, and the conversation you might have had with the with your caddy come, coming off 17 going to 18? Well, uh, you know, that's something I'll never forget. To be honest with you, that's probably the, you know, beating your former boss and my idol uh, at the PGA and and at Riviera was a really cool feeling. And, you know, I was so young, I didn't even know the value of what I was doing at the time. But uh, having gone through the hard knocks of of golf, you know, the 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 high moments and the low moments of golf and playing championship golf, uh, I knew what I was confronted with 
with trying to beat Tiger there. And uh, having held him off going to the 18th tee, you know, all the way over to the 18th tee, my caddy was doing what every good caddy would do. He was building me up, you know, and he was telling me how you're the best driver of the ball in the game. All you got to do is hit this great driver right down the center of the fairway. Believe in it. Don't think of another thing. And, you know, when I got there, uh, you know, Tiger had Eagle 16, so he had the tee, and he hits this, you know, two iron or whatever he hit, long iron, um, and he could hit it 265. And I knew I needed to hit driver to have the last shot into the – and I wanted to make sure that I had the last shot and to know what I needed to do. And so I just trusted myself and hit the driver off the tee and hit it down there really good. And we go in there and we get the yardage and I've got 176 yards. And at the time that was just a stock six iron for me. It was, you know, I didn't have to hit it hard. I didn't have to hit it easy. There was very little wind. So when I hit the shot and I said, be the right club today, I'd never said that before in my life, but basically I was wanting this to be over with. And I know how much a little puff of wind or anything could change things. I knew I'd hit it just right. I knew I'd hit it right at the hole and borrowing any outside factors. This thing's fixing to be over with. And that's what I wanted. (laughs) Yeah. What a moment. What a moment. What a, what a great moment. Um, and earlier in the year, you had something to prove to Tiger and yourself and your caddy, right? At um, where was it? At um, at L.A. at Riviera. L.A. at Riviera, exactly. Yep. Well, what I had done, you know, I'd had a a, a really pretty good year in '99, and I knew Tiger and I were going to get paired together on the West Coast, and I had called my caddy Freddie in, and I said, "Look, Freddie, I said." Somewhere down the line this next year, it's going to come down to the wire and it's going to be Tiger and I. And I said, wherever we get paired on the West Coast in the first two rounds, we need to beat him both rounds. And Freddie said, why is that? And I said, well, three people need to know we can do this. I said, you need to know I can do it. I need to know I can do it. And he needs to know I can do it. And so we got paired together at Riviera, which was great for me because I always had a lot of good, uh, you know, I played pretty well at Riviera most of the time and I beat him both rounds and, you know, lo and behold, there we are at TPC. And it was, you know, a big moment because I mean, nobody in the world thought I was going to beat him. He was beating everybody else the week before Bay Hill, you know, Davis had a three shot lead on him and, and he comes from behind and beats Davis. And Colin Montgomery made the statement at TPC that week that we're all playing for second now, essentially. And on Saturday night before the final round, uh, the media, you know, was all over me saying, how in the world do you think you can beat this guy? And I finally got so fed up with it. I said, you know, this morning when I was saying my prayers and I got up off my knees, I was praying to God, not Tiger Woods. So he's a man just like me, and we'll settle this tomorrow on the golf course. <laughs> and, <Yep. laughs> I like and, but, you know, that's what the world does. They make people bigger than life. And so in order to be tough and to be resilient and to be able to battle, which is what Raymond Floyd taught me how to do, you can't succumb to other people's thoughts. and. I wasn't going to succumb to other people's thoughts there. You know, I had the right to my own thought too. And I knew that TPC was point A to point B to point C and nobody could do that better in 2000 than I could. So I knew Tiger's power was not going to play as big a factor in the outcome of that tournament as going from point A to point B to point C. And anyway, there's your, there's your recap. That that right there, what you just said, answers the question: Why are some players better than others? It's it's just like Gary Player used to say: It's it, it, the difference is the way they think. And you were you were well, willing to have your own thoughts, and not let anybody else affect your thoughts or turn your vision away. That's so important. Well, that's the fifteenth club. That's what separates people. 
It's, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm really yeah. trying to say. That's what separates people. Some some of them fold, and some of them go for it. Now, Darren, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I guess we we, we kind of heard what. Yeah, what is what is what's your legacy? I guess we we already know. You know, you're you're out there to just help other everyone. You know, feel the same thing that you felt and and play the game at a at a at an ability they can play. And um, what 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 do you have to say? Well, I think I'm hoping that I can bridge science and art. You know, so many people. I'll give you a for instance, Jackie Burke. We're here in Houston. Jackie Burke's been a long time friend. And I told him what I was going to do. And he said, you teach with machines. I said, yeah, they call them computers and radar. And uh, he said, this is a game of art. Well, the truth of the matter is it's a game of both. And if you're a young man or a young woman out there, you don't want to be void of either one of those things. So you can get a track man from anybody. I mean, if you've got enough money, you can get a track man. You can get a nice camera. You can go buy an iPhone. You can get a nice camera. So what's going to teach you the art of the game? Someone that has been there and done it. And, you know, that's where I think my value is. I think, you know, in the old days, let's talk about Wild Bill Malhorn. Wild Bill Malhorn, how many did he win? 25 tournaments on the tour? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. See, he he was an artist. He taught you the art side of the game. And because he knew what that was. And you can't buy the art side of this game. That comes with hard work and a lot of experience. Yeah, he, he would say that your club shouldn't be longer, they should be shorter. Because he said if a surgeon had your right hand on a, on a, on a scalpel or something to cut you open, He'd get as close to the blade as he could. He's not going to get further away from the blade. And yet all the golf clubs today are longer. And you really don't have a seven iron. you got a five iron shaft with a, with, a five, with, a, with a seven iron head on the end. It has the gloss of a five iron. Yeah, well, they're all longer and lighter. And the truth of the matter is, in the old days, they were shorter and heavier so we could feel everything. And, you know, I mean, somewhere in between that is where the superstar of the future is at. And, you know, we got Bryson DeChambeau out there right now that's kind of muddy in the water and making it gray and making us think, okay, maybe this is correct. And, you know, I don't think anybody's fixing to reinvent the game to the point that something completely new is fixing to come along. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened in the game that have made it harder. You know, we used to have a, a lot of ball that spun more. We used to have uh, wooden drivers. I mean, I was hitting wooden drivers this morning. Chase and I were, and you know, he hits it 320 yards, and he didn't hit a single one of my old wooden drivers more than 278 yards. And he had never—he's 33 years, 34 years old. He'd never really played a wooden club. He had no idea what modern day equipment is doing for him. And you know. It'd be real interesting, you know, the reason why I talk about uh, the accumulation of 14 drivers, the best you can do with 14 drivers instead of one nuked driver, is because with a wooden club, you had to hit it. You can't believe how tiny those heads were in comparison to what we're playing with today. And, I mean, he hit the first two. He hit right off the toe. He said, I can't believe this. The game has changed. I was telling Darren how what, what I learned from Kanyathitis is he said, we take those old drivers and you tee the ball down low. If you had water or out of bounds on the left, then you can't hit it left. Right. Hit it a little bit in the heel, and you can just hit it as hard as you want. You're going to hit a left to right squirter. So if you're on the 18th hole and you need to make par to qualify, and there's a out of bounds on the left, tee it down low and hit it in the heel. Well, when wooden drivers were still in the bag, the best driver won the most money because most people couldn't hit a good driver. And, you know, when Metal Woods came out, everybody drove the ball well. And that's what changed the game more than anything else that's ever come along is a Metal Wood. 
You know what, Darren? Mr. Sutton here has done us a tremendous favor. Unbelievable. Because he Unbelievable. just said exactly what we're doing. You're the one with the track, yep. man. <laughs> you should yeah. know how we'll sit there for like that and that crowd and say, yeah, but, you know, there's a study out, the, 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 and there's this and that. And I say, just, just hit the, you know, the, just, just feel like you're leading yeah, the group a little bit. we've got the right bit. formula. Yeah, we've got just, the right just, formula. It's a blend of the two. You like Cal just said, right legacy. Right now, so. I mean, that's how it's we the blend of our data, data. Yeah, right? Exactly right. I, and I always learned from, from you know, all the older players that everything was, you know, like a flop shot. He used to call it, Mr. Allen used to call it an ele elevator shot. We get there, say, fourth floor, and, <laughs> and, and you pulled up, and you can hit it straight up in the air and come straight down. Say. And I was a little kid, I was like 12 years old, I'm going, fourth floor, pop it up in the air. You learn to feel your way around the golf course. You didn't necessarily, you know, you looked at shots, and you said, man, I know I can play this shot. I've played this shot before. I know what it felt like then. I'm just going to repeat it. And you, you're saying exactly the same thing. You, you made my night, partner. I have to get you a box of mud bugs. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've used up well, a lot of your time. We're out of questions. Do, do you mind taking one from the peanut gallery? Or you have to roll. No, no, I'm good. Go ahead. Right, let's, let's let's turn the microphone. Who wants to ask a question, or you put it in the chat box, and then I'll pass it along here. So we don't have the microphones driving us crazy. Let me see here. Be the right club today from Paul Orenberger. I don't know what you did. Anybody else got a question? Let me see. Maybe I can turn up a. Unmute the other mics. Okay, Thomas, you have a question? Don't all talk at once now. There's one guy on there. There's a Glenn Elder. I wonder if he's his brother Lee. <laughs> Bobby, I have, a, I have a question. This is Paul Go Arnberger. Ahead. Ahead, when, when I was younger, I remember there was a Golf Digest article, Hal, that basically said you were the next golden bear. Was that kind of pressure put on you, or did, was that something that you um, were, were happy they said that? Am I correct in saying that? Uh, there were a lot of people that talked about that. You know, to be honest with you, there's a lot of pressure that goes along with that, uh, a lot of expectations. And, you know, I, I mean, I guess – at 62 now, I, I was, uh, I'm honored that somebody thought I could be that good. I think uh, people don't realize how hard it is to win, you know, 18 majors like Jack did and 15 majors like Tiger did. And, uh, you know, and to win 10 tournaments on the PGA Tour is difficult. And in the future, there's going to be fewer and fewer people that do win 10 tournaments because there's so many good players now. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm honored that I had a place in the game. And uh, it was really good to me. And I have a lot of great memories and great friendships from it. So, uh, Jack included. Larry Frazier, he says, what would you tell a 70-year-old golfer with a 14 handicap who wants to consistently break 80? Uh, Get on the race or on the film. <laughs> Same thing I tell most everybody out there. Uh, hit one more club. I don't. I see very few people that hit enough club. Uh, most of the time, people are short all the time. Uh, there's an epidemic when it comes to chipping in the game. And the days that we learned how to play, there was more speed at the bottom. Now we've got low spin balls and highly manicured grass and lots of slope around the greens and people are trying to help the ball get in the air. They're trying to help the ball with their legs and man, there's an epidemic of poor chipping out there right now. So, uh, you know, it's tough to be good at 70 years old. Uh, it's tough to break 80 at 70 years old. I'm wondering if I can break 80 at 70 years old. So, uh, good luck with that. So, Hal, would, would you say, um, and I've heard you talk a little bit in in, in different videos about uh, shotgun patterns and hitting to the, the top of the flag. Would would that be some advice you'd give to Larry there? Uh, I, I say that all the time, hit at the top of the flag. You know, Jackie Burke used to tell me all the time, if you can't bet everything you've got in your pocket, that you've got enough club to carry over the green, then you don't have enough club. And there's not a kid today that plays with that. And, you know, all of them 
are hitting it as hard as they can hit it to give it to the flag. None of them want to go over the green. None of them. Well, Darren says that Nicholas didn't work a lot on short game, especially putting. And yet the guy that taught me as a kid, uh, he used to tell me, say, Lopez, well, you can go out and play 18 holes and not hit a green in regulation and shoot par. You come talk to me, then I'll tell you you're a player. It was a completely different mindset. Everything was was really, you know, 40 yards and in. Could you convert? Yeah. Um, what, 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 what did he used to say, Darren, about short game? Yeah, you know, um, I remember like it was yesterday. His son Michael was trying to make it on tour, and Michael said, I'm going to go work on my short game. And Jack looked at him like he was crazy. Why would you do that? And, um, you know, Jack was more about hitting the greens as opposed to short game. And, uh, you know, a lot of statistics we see nowadays kind of prove that. With, there he um, goes. There he goes. Now watch. Shut up. All right. I'm, not, all right. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> Go ahead. But, uh, you know, Jack Jack thought differently than, than a lot of people did. Obviously, the short game is important. I think the short game is the low-hanging fruit. But he was of a different mindset, you know. With And, and Phil Rogers would come out and help him with the short game. But, you know, it wasn't something he worked on, especially – my, my time around him, he never worked on his putting. So it was more about hitting greens, and the putting was more instinctive, and, and he just he, he, he willed the putt in more than anything. Yeah, I think he willed the putt in, too. I mean, I think Jack sometimes even misread it and willed it to the yep. point that it broke up ill. Yep. But, but here's the truth. Uh, you know, I, I felt like chipping, if you had to chip, it was a weakness. And, uh, you know, I never really worked on – short game that much. I worked on my putting a lot, but I never really worked on my chipping very much. And, uh, you know, I think that was an older mentality. I think the kids today pride themselves in being able to get the ball up and down. And, you know, I, I, I mean, trust me, I wish I was a better chipper. And had I been a better chipper while I was on the tour, I'd have won more golf tournaments. And, you know, it was, it was kind of, as my old coach used to say, that stinking thinking. It's stinking thinking to think that you shouldn't work on your short game. Yep. Yep. I agree. I think you just have to be able to predict what the ball's going to do. You got to see that ball, when it's going to land, see that ball rolling, and pick, and then hit the shot as just an instant replay of what you see in your mind. That's, that's the way I was taught. Well, you know what you were taught? To have an imagination. So, how many people teach imagination? We, we really want to turn this into a science game which there is no imagination in science they don't believe in imagination so i believe that in art there is imagination so where does the imagination come from hitting multiple shots all the time and knowing that you can do it so yeah you look yep. at the ground and you know i say i've seen this before i know what it's going to do it's going to kick a little left it's going to roll about so fast all about ball speed and then you feel in your hands you say i know it, I know exactly what it needs to feel like in my hands to produce just the right ball speed to get it to land right on that spot I want, and the rest of it takes care of itself. That's that's the way I was taught. So here's the Jack Nicklaus story for y'all. This okay. is before we had uh, uh, spikeless shoes. We still had spikes. I'm playing with Jack, and we're playing. I, I can't remember exactly where we were playing, but it was somewhere where we had bent grass greens. And I'm watching Jack. We played later in the day. And I'm watching him walk around the green, and he goes over to the other side of the hole, and he's looking at what's on the other side of the hole. So finally, after we got finished, I said, you know, i got to ask you a question. I watched you all day long, and you were looking at different uh, things that were past the hole from the line you were coming on. And I said, what were you looking for? He said, I was looking for all the spike marks to see where everybody that had come from my direction was putting the next putt from. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. brilliant. Think about that. No, Think about, so, 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 that. so, is that art or is that science? That I'm is, just that curious. Is art. And it yes. just goes back to our first question about art and uh, and data. And we certainly appreciate your time here uh, tonight, Hal. So, how how can people get a hold of you? Where, where oh, yeah, can they find realize. you? Hal Sutton Golf. It's uh, it's a, yeah, our website, okay. and all the details are there. Hal Sutton awesome. Golf, Houston, Texas. I tell you what, Houston's a fun town. I miss Bob it's, Phillips. It's, <laughs> well, <laughs> I miss Bob Phillips. Well, he was a riot. He was good. Hey, life life is changing. In case y'all haven't noticed. Oh, you got that right. 
<laughs> I'm serious. But we're really honored, and we'll uh, we'll send you a copy of this tape. Sounds great. I enjoyed being on with y'all. Oh, listen, you're the you're the best. You really are. You you opened up. You just did a, you did so much for us. You have no idea. Yeah, and you almost made Bobby cry. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, y'all have a great day. Right. God bless you. Thank Al. you. Thanks, Thank Al. you. Thank you.